The search for something eternal is one of Utena's core motifs, but there are two more questions we need to remember on top of this one. Those questions are, if something eternal exists, do we want it? Should we seek it? What if pain is the only thing that's eternal? Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Put them on your engagement rings, your wedding rings, your 50th anniversary gift. When Toga and Sayonji were children, they found a girl curled up in a coffin, lying on a bed of roses. Her parents had died, and she had no one. Her entire life was the graveyard. She asked them both to show her something eternal. But they could not do it, for they were children. All they had was innocence, and there is nothing eternal about that. So, Toga and Sayanji couldn't do it. Sayanji ran away before even trying. But then her prince came to save her, and he showed her something truly eternal. In the entire series of Utena, there is only one thing ever said to be eternal. And when Utena sees it, she weeps. She begs for her prince to save the girl from eternity, and the prince refuses. He cannot save her. No one can. Utena may have had a glimpse of eternity, but she doesn't remember it for much of the series. And more importantly, she doesn't seek it. Instead, the themes of eternity fall most frequently from the mouth of Toga. His failure as a child haunts him. What, he wonders, could he have said that would have made him Utena's prince in truth? What wisdom did his childhood deny him? He rejects childhood. He rejects friendship, trust, family. None of that is eternal. None of that is what he's looking for. In Utena's 39 episode run, there is only one named male adult. Toga looks up to him, idolizes him, aspires to be him. This is who Toga wants to be when he grows up. Will that let him understand eternity? Of course not. Utena was in her coffin. Anthe was in her coffin. She even went further. This whole school is your coffin, she told Akio. Eternity is your enemy. Leave the coffin. Let it go. He doesn't, of course. Are memories eternal? Only as long as we cling to them. Utena never remembered her promise until the very end. None of the Black Rose duelists remembered their duels. All of the boys who died in the fire were forgotten. All of the princes were forgotten. Even Utena herself is forgotten by the world. But was that such a bad thing? Is love eternal? Nanami loves her brother. Anthe loves the memory of her brother. Akio loves Dios. Utena loves... <laughs> Juri loves Shiori. Most characters love memories more than people. It's easy to argue that Nanami doesn't love her brother, but instead the precious childhood that she yearns to return to. That Anthe's willingness to stay with Akio is entirely due to her love of the child her brother once was. That Akio seeks to return to a state he's too cynical to ever reach. That Utena looks back at her coffin and thinks, Was it so bad in there? I don't think I'll ever forget the impact of listening to Jury's first apocalypse song. Jury's emotions over Shiori are tumultuous tragic, and ultimately unchanged duel by duel. She's in love, she's been in love since before Utena ever set foot within the academy, 
and she's still in love with Shiori at the end of her final duel. What pains her is hope, hope and regret. If only Shiori didn't know that she loved her, then their relationship would be unchanged. If only Shiori loved her. Her captain doesn't understand. Why devote yourself to the happiness of someone who will never see the misery their happiness is built on? Why do it? Juri longs for a miracle, but she's willing to accept the reality of her situation. Being with Shiori is better than not being with Shiori. Being within the school is the only way for her to be with Shiori. Does true love's kiss happen within the series? Was it when the prince kissed Utena as a young girl? When he kissed her ring during the show's finale? When Utena and Anthe grasped hands only for a moment, was that true love's kiss? No. The fairy tale framing of Utena Revolutionary Girl is, itself, an illusion, just like the castle in the sky. The castle and the observatorium are inseparable. The prince and the princess are inseparable. The witch and the girl are inseparable. True love's kiss doesn't exist. No one can help Utena. No one can save Anthe. The bride takes the swords. To be a prince is to let the bride take the swords. To be a duelist of the rose is to let the bride take the swords. Except they're not letting Anthe do anything, are they? She climbs up there of her own free will. Every time. Anthe rejects eternity to leave the school. The school is eternal because Akio built it. Akio is eternal because he's trapped inside it. Anthe is eternal because... Anthe doesn't want eternity. She wants a future with Utena. The swords and the rose are inseparable. Was this true love's kiss? No. Utena hadn't admitted her feelings. Anthe was still grappling with what consent even was, what it meant to willingly draw the sword instead of having it yanked from her own chest. This was their beginning, not their end. The castle in the sky is a fantasy, but the gate at the heart of the world is real. That's the truth of Utena's world. Did you know? A jar of canned peaches can typically last between 18 and 24 months, but can theoretically remain edible for decades, maybe even a hundred years. Utena's parents died when she was a child, leaving her all alone. When her prince finds her, she is terrified, so scared of life that she has remained in the graveyard, unwilling to leave and face the world without them. Diho saved her from that coffin. Right. Why did Utena leave the coffin? Why did she grow up seeking to be a prince? The eternity Diaz showed her was not her own. It was Anthe's. She left the coffin, promising that one day she would be the prince that Dios could not be. That she would save Anthe from eternity. But was that such a good idea? Sayanji, Toga, and Akio all take their turns playing at being Utena's prince. Sayanji's case is quickly dismissed and quickly dispatched. He's the starter villain, more closely connected to Toga than he is to Atena, a reflection of a reflection of a knight. He fights Utena in the first duel to prove one thing. Duels in Utena aren't about swordsmanship. Skill will not revolutionize the world. Toga is fond of buying Utena fancy dresses and feminine gifts. He's charmed by her insistence on wearing the boy's uniform, and likes the way she sees the world, 
but actively destroys what he likes about her as he attempts to become close to her. Toga lied to his sister about their blood relationship in order to destroy their relationship, and burned Seonji's diary in order to destroy their childhood bond. He has no friends, no family. In episode 37, Toga and Utena go on their only ever actual date. He takes her up to the castle, which is also the observatory, and they stare out at the stars. It is a fragile and quiet moment, and possibly the most genuine moment of vulnerability Toga experiences in the entire series. Anthe sits alone in her bed and stares at the stars. She knows where Utena is. She is, after all, in the same building. Utena rejects Toga. He's not her prince, and she doesn't want him to be. When Akio reveals himself to be the end of the world, the audience has known for ages, and even Utena doesn't seem that surprised. There is something deeply upsetting about seeing Utena in the pink rose bride dress. She's been in a pink rose petal dress before, the one that Toga brought her for the ball comes to mind, but this one is worse. Utena rejects this dress just as she did during the ballroom scene, ignoring her suitor in favor of rushing to Anthe's aid, being Anthe's prince. But she can never be Anthe's prince. Colacanths were once thought to be extinct until a live one was caught in 1938. They were known only from fossils into a live Latimeria halumne was discovered off the coast of South Africa in 1938. Until then, they were presumed to have gone extinct in the late Cretaceous period, over 65 million years ago. Many consider them to be living fossils. The swords that pierce Anthe symbolize the hatred of the world. As a child, Anthe willingly faced the mob outside her brother's door and she has willingly offered herself up as a shield for Akio ever since. The idea that a prince could save Anthe from such a fate is laughable. Anthe offers herself to such a fate because of Dios, the prince. Ruka Tsuchiya tells Juri that Shiori is cruel, a liar, and a selfish person who prefers to never see the unhappiness that her actions cause in others. The miracle that she might love you was a doomed miracle. The friendship that you cherished meant nothing to her. Her jealousy of you overwhelms your tragedy. Give up. Juri never loses to Atena, each duel she takes part in ending in an awful scene of self-defeat. The miracle that Tsuchiya denies also means that Juri will never love him. He offers her sympathy in defeat, but Juri wants nothing from him. His love burdens her. He tries to save her by destroying what's precious to her. He can never be her prince. Edison didn't actually invent the light bulb, merely improving on something that already existed. In episode 38, Akio confesses that the stars bore him. This is not meant to come as a shock. Utena has commented on this before, much, much earlier. He is looking at something beyond the stars. Beauty means nothing to him if he cannot possess it. All of the scenes of Toga's past are gleaned from Nanami and Sayanji's perspectives, as Utena never remembers meeting him. In Nanami's memories, she drowns a cat that she thinks he loves. In the Shadow Girls play, Toga is the cat. Sayanji's memories are even simpler. Once, Toga allowed him to see him wounded. They were equals, one not above the other. After the second dueling cycle, Utena sees Mickey's sunlight garden and comments that she thought it would be more. 
Anthe reports this to Akio, who wonders what she means by this. Anthe, too, doesn't understand. Duels in Utena are not won with skill, nor are they strictly fought one versus one, nor are they really about anything except the deepest conflicts of longing and ideals. Utena herself rarely understands the weight of the history of the person she's fighting, and she's not meant to deliver a shonen speech that will show that person the error of their ways. Sometimes she empathizes with her opponent, but often she is simply angry. Why did you take your issues to the castle in the sky? Why do you need Anthe for your own selfish wish? Why have you forced me to come here? Why? Why? She is oblivious to all but the most blatantly cruel of Sayanji's actions, uncomprehending of the arrogant conclusions that lead Mickey to challenge her, unaware of the deep sorrow within Jury, confused by why Nanami hates her, and stunningly blind to both Togo's affection and his malice. Perhaps the only duelist who she ever fights with full comprehension of his actions is Akio. Utena has a strange and deep understanding of Akio. He's someone similar to her, but someone she can never be. Why? Throughout the series, Utena has one sticking point. She refuses to say something bad about Anthe. Akio often attempts to bait her into saying something like, Isn't Anthe irritating? Isn't she unpleasant to have around? But he will quickly drop the subject once Utena sticks her ground. When Utena first challenged Sayanji, the only thing she knew about Anthe was that it was wrong for anyone to be treated like that. Then, once she learned the proper terminology, that it was wrong for someone to be the Rose Bride. This is a belief that Utena never, at any point, stops having though for most of the series, she doesn't really understand what having this belief means. If it's wrong for someone to be the Rose Bride, then is it wrong to duel for the Rose Bride? Yes. If it's wrong to duel for the Rose Bride, then is it wrong to duel at all? Yes. If it's wrong to duel at all, then... Late in the third season, Utena receives tickets to a student play. She invites both Akio and Anthe, and they sit on either side of her in an empty theater, captive audience to a play where they are both the actors and the characters. In the second recap episode of All of Revolutionary Girl Utena, Utena, Anthe, and Nanami speak as shadowy figures behind the hospital curtain in the infirmary, gossiping about past events while they read Suwabaki's diary. On the other side of the curtain, little Suwabuki blushes in his bed. Just like all recaps in Utena, something interesting and thematically relevant is revealed here. The incident that caused Nanami to think that Suwabuki was her prince was, in fact, intentionally caused by the boy to make her fall in love with him. The girls laugh. Nanami is embarrassed, scoffing about the whole thing. Toga is her prince, not Tsubuki. How could he be her prince? He's just a boy. Of course, Toga is still just 17. In episode 13, Tracing a Path, Akio recaps each duel. All of the power of Dios might be revived with her, Akio says. In this sentence, he encapsulates his every motive and goal. The Rolls duels are an endless cycle, doomed to break against the end of the world. Every cycle, the Rose Bride will betray the duelist, and present to Akio the Sword of Dios. Every cycle, Akio will alight upon the path to eternity, and use the revived power of Dios to batter and break that sword against the Rose Gate and every cycle, he fails. He is the chick, the school is his egg. 
If he doesn't break the school's shell, he will die without being born. The elevator shaft so prevalent in the second season of Utena visually returns twice more in season 3. Hinami finds herself trapped in a red-lit elevator after seeing the truth of Akio's relationship with Anthe. It is a piercing moment of self-centered despair for her, as instead of thinking of Anthe's pain, she can only think of her own. This is what could happen to her. She has no choice but to seek a revolution. The elevator also returns in the finale of the entire series. Utena is trapped within it, the sword in her lap and her pink rose bride dress hung up beside her. Before going to duel the end of the world, Utena took off her rose seal ring in a fit of anger, and when she put it back on, it was blackened with the embers of the black rose duelists. The elevator shudders, hurling downwards faster and faster. Though the building where the Black Rose Circle was hosted has long since been burned down, it did once exist. Change is possible, even within the unchanging boundaries of the school. Finals may come and go without the seasons ever changing, but children can learn and grow. In the third and final recap episode of the series, titled The Prince That Runs Through the Night, Anthe has closed the windows of the observatory and placed false images of stars over the blank wall. She has finished her delivery of roses from the garden, and now they lie beside Akio. While Edison didn't invent the light bulb, he did invent the phonograph. The phonograph machine has two cylinders, one for recording and one for playback. The first ever song heard from such a device was, the story goes, a rendition of Mary Has a Little Lamb. In The Cowbell of Happiness, Hinami receives a whole couture necklace that looks exactly like a mundane, oversized cowbell. Overcome with embarrassment at the fact that Jerry has a more expensive necklace on her than her previously prized medallion, Hinami throws it all away and puts on the cowbell instead, so confident in the packaging that she willingly ignores anyone who decries the necklace. It must be from her brother. And are they decrying her brother's taste? The song that plays during this episode is one of two songs that plays solely during Nanami's episodes, and is one of my favorite songs. The song, titled The Calf, but known mainly as Donna Donna, was originally composed by Shalom Secunda and Aaron Zaytan for a Yiddish play in 1940. The meaning of the song likely comes from a story of the Talmud, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, also known as Judah the Prince, came to meet a young calf destined for the slaughterhouse. The calf places its head under the rabbi's coat and cries. Go, the rabbi says to the calf, it was for this that you were created. But for this statement, the rabbi was struck with 13 years of terrible pain and suffering. He should have shown mercy he should have accepted that no creature is born to die. The same red overlay visible for Nanami's frightening realization within the observatory tower appears as Nanami transforms into a cow, the plain and funny nature of the episode slowly giving way to a dire warning of Nanami's deepest fears. Your brother will sell you. Your brother will kill you. Your brother will eat you. Anthe sent her that cowbell. As she said to the shadow girls, you reap what you sow. Get it? When complaining to Mickey about how she doesn't want to live at the observatory, he offers to switch with her. I'll go, he says, if you hate it so much there. In perhaps her most genuinely and intentionally kind act of the entire series, Nanami refuses him. Exposing Nikki to Akio would be an awful thing to do, and she won't do it. 
She won't sacrifice someone else for her escape. At the end of the world, the bells of the school <gasps> ring, signaling a winner. Utena lies on the ground, pained and hurt. Anthe takes the sword from her and offers it to Akio. Utena has lost the duel called Revolution. Never more will she hear the song of the apocalypse. She has gone as far as the system was designed to allow her. If we don't break the chick's shell, we will die without being born. Smash the world's shell. Utena shoves Akio aside. She doesn't need him, doesn't want him, and doesn't care about him. A minor obstacle in her path. If Anthe is the only one in this world that can't become a princess, then Utena doesn't need to become a prince. Discard that which is eternal. Turn away from that that shines. Disregard the power of miracles. Disdain. The revolution of the world. Only complete the revolution of self and leave this coffin behind. Persephone ate of the forbidden seed and was trapped for half of every year of her immortal life. Orpheus bargained for his beloved safety, only to lose faith in her moments before she would be free forever. Utena doesn't wait for Anthe to leave. She's done with Otori Academy. Anthe leaves her brother behind in his cage because she wants to. She has seen eternity, and in the end, what she wants is to see what life would be like with Utena at her side. Somewhere in the world outside the egg, she'll find her. Hi, I'm Zar, and this is my channel for talking about anime, animation, and storytelling concepts. Like, comment, and subscribe.